So what you're going to accept is fairpoint.com. That is Microsoft, right? So they start to put the limited content up on the shared side to share out. Well, this guy didn't come right. You can't block that URL if you're going to shut down all the legitimate use cases. So now it gets a lot more tricky to have to deal with. You have to go, block it out of employees and lost it. Track which employees are active on that site during the time that they're spending your receipt so you block and keep it out. Determine if they were actually affected. In this case, fortunately, though, the purchase link for our system was not paid. I would expect to get an email about this. Uh, so they're asking for a business statement, a financial statement, or something like that. So we spent that first page, it took years. We were able to check that out, but yeah, that was taking years. Another interesting one as well, uh, it really looks hard to read, read the text, but this one has the subject of uh, case ID number 94893, notification account update, dear Rackface user, important information, you're required to verify, will cancel your account, it's only a one time process. If you look at that from address, rack.space help desk, notifications that, whoa, what's that all about, right? So they're taking advantage of the fact that people get email on their phones, your phone only has so much space on it. So what's your web email client going to do or your phone email client going to do? It's going to cut off a bunch of that excess text, right? So they're going to see track space. Well, if you know about the technical parts of how email messages work, you see those little less than greater than signs? Because you need to know email address part, anything in quotes is the name. But in this case, they're trying to escape filters by putting all that inside the name section. And then they had some, this is like a Gmail or Yahoo.it text actual email address in there, and the reply to header field will not anything close to that space. So, but it's interesting to think about it. Someone on their smartphone, if you look at this, they have Russ Wilson on that phone, right? Or maybe they're on a tablet, or maybe they're, of course, on their desktop computer, they're more likely to catch that and see it. But their goal is to try to fool the client by making the address look difficult to read, so that they, they could use change employees, hey, check the field, check the from, say rectus.com or your company.com. Well, one of the things they try to do is trick them because they know, oh, some people kind of look for that. So, though, if you get first like, glance at that, it'd be tricked by it because they're hoping it's not falling for it. Fake domains. This one was from another fake domain. This one says, uh, voicemail at rackspacevoicemail.com. Yeah, we don't have that. We don't have full voicemail. They just click the link and listen to it. That gives you an email or anything like that. And we haven't done any special partnership with Microsoft. Sounds great for the welcome. Fake tickets. So this one was not even close to Rackspace.com in the email. They had the word Rackspace and there was no reply at Team Challenge at CC. Don't think our marketing team's gone into that yet. So I must check with them, right? So did one of those other ones like your customer, let's check the security, let's check the clean, ask for credit. LinkedIn, pretty awesome, right? Man, if you need to go in and you want to get some intel to break the tech tech companies, get some target spear phishing, go to the public LinkedIn profile, read them. Well, you get the public profile to avoid. You can get someone to like, follow you or connect you to your LinkedIn. That lets you see more of their LinkedIn with the to you, right? You need even more data than just the public part. So don't go past the recon to active recon. So we have some going on. Hey, go on the LinkedIn. Yeah, our CSO didn't like that. So I told everyone, you get this, report it, and here's the question of how you block them on the Because uh, Josh Miller didn't do that. Recon. Packers claim to be some executive. Sit from my iPad. That's my favorite little tagline. Why does this email look a little strange? Why is it from the different domain? Oh, the executives on their iPad, they use their BYOD device. They don't have their breakfast email on it, right? So that's the free gist of the Packers trying to throw at them. Good morning. Please just pass for me. They didn't put any attachments in this. No, 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 no links, no images, plain text email, right? So, oh, no big deal, right? Well, what their goal was is get the record reply. Oh, great, now I'm on a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody. And they think that I'm they're talking back to the exec or whoever it was that they tried to contact. Now I can start trying to ask them more questions, trying to make them trust me a little bit more. Then I drop, hey, here's an offer. So, they're trying to be more sneaky, a little bit more subtle about how they're trying to get in. Because no attachments, no leaks. The existing filtering software is going to say so that it's a flag, right? 
fishing ourselves. So use our wetness training, from we all time, security groups in, fishing alerts out, test up and the company employees, tries to see who picks it, staff about. We're at, you can use our education for your training, right? A lot of times, um, the perception is for the people your own, your other employees for targeting that, oh no, you really got me again. So, then that's not always the most effective way, really, but it gives you somewhere to start, right? So, this is one that we actually could conducted ourselves against our own company. So, we do a little info retail. We don't tell our stock analysts about it. We tell some management, of course, they approve it, sign off on it. And then we just make it sound urgent. This one was like, hey, HR, we have a candidate, we're always qualified. I have trouble with the stock in the US, we don't want to lose the candidate. Um, and then we at least tell website, and then we ask for the so what do we do about fishing, right? What are those technologies that are available to us today? You know, we have filtering technology, companies that specialize in that. Um, there's also the DMARC technology, that's the main base, measures all authentication, reporting, and conformance. In fact, it's the long way of saying that there's two different types of technologies that you can configure in your email system, and that other participating people who have email systems can configure as well to validate, hey, did this email really come from Rackspace.com or example.com? Is this sent by an authorized server? Did someone try to forge an email with the front header, right? Um, the main thing you have to realize about that, as you turn this on, if you haven't turned it on ever before, is turn it on slowly. It has options to go from no reporting, report, emails that don't have the sensor expected to fully block them, as well as take a percentage of that, only block 10%, block 20%, drag that to 100%. Because what you find, especially at large companies, is that, oh yeah, there's this one third party that was sending emails to customer from an automated ticketing system that now that's a pretty threat for the next 24 hours until we can get the DNS changes that at that time for it. So, you don't want to break your email system, limit the ability to use them to the customers or the other employees. But it is a nice option that, you know, of course, Google, Yahoo, work together, a lot of large companies to add this capability so we can help reduce the amount of code that can work with email. Also, just inform your customers and employees. Where should they expect email to come from? What the main thing that email come from that comes to your customers' questions? Talk like that. Where do people go to report suspicious email? Do your employees know how to report a suspicious email? We have to put posters all around our office and tell people, if you get a suspicious email, forward it to this address. You will check it out for you. Um, and then is there an alternative contact method to verify the content of the message? Yes, it's called the phone. So, our instant messaging, something other than email, you don't want to hit reply directly right back to the tag or email, right? Yeah, so, we encourage people to use things like that. And then, of course, have an instant response plan. Have your thoughts, have procedures, because you get a report from someone that says, hey, I clicked this email, I typed in my thread, and then I realized I should have looked for this email, and they'll contact you, hopefully, so if you feel afraid to, you can take an instant response plan that. Take good advice, take it off the network, then put it into a control you can re-fix it into the laptop and turn your good things back out. And then of course, test those systems. So that's one of the things that our team does. We send out those test phishing emails. We don't tell our software we're doing it from. We love AWS for that because we still burn an IP. Oops, a new IP, no big deal. And test that out, send it through, and see if they catch it, how they respond to it, what do our employees do. Um, and the two-factor authentication is very helpful. So, your employees give out their user and password, but you have two-factor authentication. It is going to slow an attacker down. Um, it's not foolproof, so a lot of you push the web up being bypassed. But it sure does make that a one step higher and can discourage people attackers who are trying to use those threads to use the ball. Employee awareness training, so metrics for effectiveness. If you're going to do programs, you got to justify the management, funding for it, all that great stuff. Um, you can get some pretty useful numbers out of these types of exercises. Whether it's real attacks that come in or similar to that, it's just done. You have the number of successful attacks. How many times this month did you have employees fall for a phishing thing you have to credit? Um, the number of reported phishing things. How many times have employees actually reported the phish before they fell for it? And then your simulation. How many people did you send it out to? How many people reported it? How many people clicked the link? How many people gave us their credentials and didn't? So if I send out 200 emails as an exercise, how many people just looked at that email? Other notables, 
Um, the other users weren't people who understood the way they fit. So we'll have times where we do that exercise and someone picks up. Oh, look, security's at it again, trying to send us fish in, trying to get us. And they'll warn their colleagues by IM or things like that. Or sometimes there'll be a group of people who get a real fish and they'll warn their colleagues by IM or they'll by email sometimes, they'll send for email. And that is a win. You know, for us, it's, it's a team where, like, man, great. We only got like 10 people out and emails for the Figured it out and they shut it down for the other 190 we're trying to do, right? So that's actually a good thing because you're on employees, and we're talking non security minded employees, people who don't have that training are going along and telling each other, hey, there's this fish, watch out for it. It's going to have to be a very positive thing. It's going to be very like, what are they doing there? They're not going to security a lot of times, they're telling each other, right? So going on in the next topic, DDoS amplification. So this is another attack that we see in that space. And the primary goal is to turn a compromised system to a weapon to attack other people. Um, in this instance that I've talked about, the target actually wasn't Rackspace or a Rackspace customer. They actually found Rackspace resources stuck in the cloud by other customers and people that were left exposed, and they used that to then make our system to a DDoS and someone else. So the causes was really lack of firewall rules. Someone was doing this lab, teaching a group of students, spun up some servers, didn't bother with firewall rules, because it's only a short, you know, one, two-day lab. Oh, we forgot to turn those off. Sorry. We'll set those off now. So, detection, anonymous traffic patterns. So you can see this before that happens. Like, hey, look, all of these systems are starting to drop a bunch of packets out through DNS responses. That's not odd. They're not our DNS servers. Um, our reports from other ISPs where I've used contact, so my ISP gets it by that's the practical of the internet. We send us an email for our abuse contact. We track the IP, review them, and then follow the team with that. Other examples, open DNS resolvers, the two common ones. Someone closed up a DNS server with the figure. It's used to just tap other people. LDAP. I don't really understand why people are sort of LDAP on the internet, but that's just for their loud examples and stuff, maybe. Um, but it does seem to happen. Hard compromised web app, WordPress, Google, Deacon, things like that. So, when you're talking about it, whether you're Amazon, Google, Azure, or even smaller players, any of that across your ISP, you're going to have people either trying to attack you, or they're going to try to compromise systems and servers, walk through your customers, or other people that attack other people. And you have to be able to have an instant response plan for that, and you can help people that. Try to ideally detect it before someone has to contact you to try to get Brute force. If you've ever spun up a server on the internet and stuff your SSH port open, um, it's really great to log, watch the log fill up with people trying to do uh, login and the various different bots and the popular bots at the time to set up a honeypot one to capture what you can pass it to the time to get this SSH which is pretty cool. Um, RDP, of course, web application login pages, most common ones that might be used for the login page, just things up there on the internet. All the time. Methods, dictionary, word list, are for some reach that take passwords out of that, try to make the passwords and the passwords and sites. Um, the pond that's up, for example, is just here to use the system for that. So, nothing really new there, but something you have to deal with that people are constantly trying to break down with the board. Handling, you can analyze the IP sources and block them. IP address cat and mouse, right? And if you want to block that, and if you new group, you block those. But that's a pretty good benefit of having a practice group cell, because it means they're getting bounced to your quest and stuff like that. Um, and they're saying they're trying to get to your login page as a file provider. Whatever, we'll just take it. So you spin up a bunch of cloud resources, let them burn themselves out for a week, and then when they're done, you spin them back down. So that's nice because we're able to save the money to input the cost of the code of ourselves and our customers. Um, monitoring compromised accounts is also another one. So let's say you've seen this group of IP from a country constantly battering, trying to do attempted login break in. You didn't look at it and you get tripping around. But then you see a successful login on a customer account. So one of those IPs that you tried to dial them and failed to log in for other accounts, right? That's a pretty good indicator that you have a customer who had a new password. You can guess. You can actually go in, fire up an alert, send news to that happen, action on it. So down the account, so you look up this account, look at the customer if they have a problem, 
prison for one more time on the occasion. Um, he just only lived off for three years, but not as popular as we really liked him. So I think he had a lot more luck than that. that. So, get on to talk about customer accounts. I didn't find it. We talked a moment ago about those three force login accounts. Try to do app attacks or see a successful login after enough keys and try to look for successful attempts. Um, other user activity, we have an account that's set there, very flat, number of servers, things like that. And all of a sudden, they spun up the maximum allowed number of servers and most of the GPU entries they can to say we're running 100%. It's like, well, we can contact their account manager and ask them if we uh, just want a lot more sales, it'd be awesome. Or we need to verify for customer, hey, did you really want to spin up, you know, 20 GPU instances of this price and stuff that you really didn't have to regard? It's, but if you're not, not a good thing. So, our the customer gets in on one of the bills in the month, right? So maybe the staff to get up the max. They only added one. You just put the current to my or whatever. They try to use it under the radar. They can get caught right away. And then the customer gets in on one of the bills in the month. They come and complain. They don't want to pay that. So that's the whole infrastructure we did, right? So we have a whole fraud department that goes to those issues. We watch the pattern, identify traffic traffic, uh, and activity in that. Um, are we going to report to some ISPs to start using the email address uh, on occasion as well? Just mean, hey, so we're trying to run this known warrant from this IP address of yours, and then we can work to start talking about, about that as well. Actually, like I mentioned, disable the account. You can also do forensic activity on the instance. So if they were spinning it up to try to program the system, or they're running a particular cryptocurrency miner, you can take that forensic image, look at the activity, the malware they use, and you go through and scan your other customers' systems to see if they have any on there to help them clean out as well. Hacking ourselves. So the group I work in, uh, we do most of the vulnerability management or day-to-day -day kind of bread and butter, PCI, in the car industry. But other areas that we get to do as well, we look at around and the non-PCI stuff. Uh, one example is the company's staffing calendar that we use for being able to schedule in and out of work and stuff like that. I'm going to cross that scripting bug. Go to my teammates, all right, we're getting free time off in the next two months. So, you know, the manager has to go in and prove that. But then we got to cross that scripting, you're getting all those the manager will the pay job. But, you know, really, we didn't actually do that. It's not so inside joke. But, uh, goal of the team is really to help identify weaknesses that we have and whether security processes are our systems and to assist with remediation of those issues to help further user awareness and security. So, one of the other interesting hacks that I got to do was the missing authentication. Going along, looking along the systems one day, had a little rest of time, found a system that was a system management server, and the authentication point was completely turned off. First, I auto logged in, I was like, okay, I need to click my browser down. I closed them out, and started logged out of everything. Went back and opened it up and said, cool, we go. And was like, I 
took in a string that had a value of 9p in it, which is now handed by 2 to 9 down. In this example here, I have to put 2j1 here. If I do a stop, that is going to have to be a So that's how you look at that equation. The highlighted section just shows that the workspace orders have limited piece of code to general. But uh, it doesn't even have to go pop up. So I took the code from above, pop it down to the general. Oh, you can add a whole new function to the server. So you come over and you can change that now down here.
Wiki plugin. So we have a popular software that we use for Wiki, and it's pretty fun. So there's a lot of couple third-party plugins you can install on the band. The one that they installed was one that enables the use of JavaScript or Groovy. Groovy is Java. I did Java Dev for about ten years full time, so it's pretty awesome. I love programming it. Groovy is pretty cool. So I wrote a Groovy script and I put it into a Wiki page, and then the server executed my code. So I got me a nice little web shell code out of that. And that was a lot of fun. And uh, remediation solutions that one actually ended up being, hey, admin, you have a special page tool on the wiki that will tell you every page that uses this plugin anywhere. So they ran that, they found the only page that you could find. It's like, nah, I don't have really good to do this. Don't install the plugin. So that was another nice thing to do. But for those of you to be aware of, you may have patched your main core software of your favorite wiki, but how many plugins are there? Did they review it before they installed them? Did they want to check it since then? Here's another great one. So we use Rapid Seven's tool for a lot of our vulnerability management and scanning. And they had a CD that they released a couple months ago now. And the original vulnerability of this was not found by myself. It was that any off user that was not a global admin to your tool would go in there and get the report for their size and their systems. Well, it turns out they could download data that included the global admin chapter numbers. At some point, a developer added, hey, we need more diagnostic data, so let's add that to this tool. So you get the hack version of their password, right, for the global admin. So they call it one patch, change all your global admin passwords. Well, I was poking at it some more on the unpatched version, and noticed that, hey, there's this other config policy that I've seen before. And it's the one that holds the clear text password that holds the encryption key for my database backup of my graphic 7 software. And they didn't do anything about that. And when I asked them in the past, how do I change the password anyway? They're like, oh, you can't. So I had to contact the vendor. Um, they didn't have any official supported way to change that, so I had to make sure we had a good backup. Um, the vendor came up with a hidden UI feature that wasn't there that one software engineer didn't know about. It was never finished and released. So they showed me how to turn that on. I was able to go in and change the password to a new one and verify that. And turn it back and it and all that. So it was interesting. I contacted the product security team and said, hey, you have to release this. You know about this. That's the way it works. It's not just have passwords. Here's the nice description for the database. And so they went and updated their advisory and released that on it. And uh, things like that. So if you use Rapid 7 and you're like, oh man, I think we're affected by this, you can hit up your vendor support and they have a way that they have to step you through because you don't want to officially corrupt your system. But that was a fun one to find as well. Some of the security tools that we use, we also take that security itself. So in laptop scenario, this is another fun one where we're testing our own company's processes. So our goal was to test the process we saw on laptops, right? We had one, we to see how well that process worked, was there anything missing from it. The idea is that we'd use a company loaner laptop, and we'd use my own. And I was at home, chilling at a cafe, away from the office, and I was logged into my desktop, on the VPN, doing all my work, I turn around, step away for a second, pick up some uh, my drink or whatever, right? Now I come back around, no, it was my laptop. So what can I do? Oh, I know, I have to, I have to call the 
Help desk. Okay, I got to remember my laptop. So they're like, oh yeah, I got my smartphone. So I pull out my phone. They're like, all right, I find the phone number for my help desk. Call them up. Right away. So I contact the help desk. He tell me contact physical security and physical devices. All right. So I call them up. They give me instructions. Fill out a report. Get a police report. Fill out this report. I was like, oh yes, I saw my mobile device. You can see my email and all. Put the report there. Put it in all. Meanwhile, this thief is delighted to have a logged in device, right? So I'm going to VPN everything. So our poor victim, unfortunately, was on the phone and never asked if the device was turned on, or if he was logged in, or anything like that. If you got a stolen laptop, most times, it was sent to the phone with right? So the thief sees the, re the report request email from him, right? And he takes care of that, he's with email. So not only that, he decides, oh, this victim reported me. So he does a little down, down, left, kick, hot, code. And he takes screenshots of the stolen laptop device unlocked. And then he emails it to, to the victim himself. He says, I stole your present. And then the victim gets an email on their phone. And they're all confused. What's going on? So the victim calls by phone to the physical help desk, security desk again. And it says, I'm having trouble with that reporting email. My email's not the time screen. It's a bit deleted, by the way. And uh, the security, fortunately, the security person realized at that point, but oh, they kind of realized off that clue that I gave them that the laptop was still turned on, stuff like that. So they go run over to the SOC um, and go get some assistance from them about getting the procedure kicked off to get that device off the network. So the result was that my account and my VPN were terminated. So my VD account was no longer functional, disabled, not needed. The laptop was banned from the network. The SOC is notified at the end of the exercise. The next day, I went on to work. So and there's our normal SOC handoff meeting, you know, and they're like, and they were very discreet. They didn't want to like embarrass me with my colleagues. So they all thought, like, man, I got a laptop stolen. He was wrong. He was good. I don't know about this. So it was actually pretty considerate of my feelings, actually. But then they wait till like the rest of my colleagues walked out of the room, right? And so uh, and he started telling me like, oh no, God, that was an exercise stolen. So that's when I told them next day, we wanted them to go through the procedure for a little bit. Um, at that point, I was at home. I was like, all right. Time, so I shut the laptop off, did all this, you know, all that stuff, you know, put on my rest of my evening, um, and they never called me about it like that. Well, that was the loader laptop, right? Like my main laptop, you know, messed with or whatever. But uh, they didn't realize that, and so the they couldn't get a hold of me, they blocked all of my devices. So I was going to the office the next day, plug in, block, I was like, oh, yeah, this is good, my laptop's blocked, it's supposed to be the stolen device, I don't know which one it was, that's technically correct, right, cool, cool. Then I go up to the help desk, and, hey, I'm an AD account, it's not working, you guys just get my password or something, guy looks at you, know, looks at us all the time, they just look at the screen, they look at me, he's like, look at my badge, I'm thinking, I'm looking at him like, you think I was fired, huh? You're like, how did this guy get the building? Do terribly. This is the only thing they don't really see the way it was blocked, right? You just shut down. So they try to call my manager to get my account unlocked for a procedure. That's pretty good stuff, right? They're calling procedure. Procedure's working. They didn't just let some guy scroll back in that was fired to get back to the network. Well, my manager, even though I told him multiple times the date that I needed to be around, was not anywhere in sight. No one contacted my phone. So they call my manager's manager. Guess what? He didn't know what was going on. So I'm sitting there like, well, I got a free morning now, I guess. So I go around, I'm like, oh, let's see if I can go on the network. I'm supposed to. No, they left me out pretty good. They left me out pretty good. Oh, my, my mobile phone that I had all my stuff on? Yeah, that was good. So, hey, you have no emails going on your phone? No meetings you can go to on your calendar? You don't need structure for one. Get some good walks around the office and stuff like that. Eventually, I went over and got another manager. They went in and uh, got my systems unlocked from the network. Got my account re enabled, laid it out, so I wouldn't down all day. But that was a good uh, lesson learned about married activity is get your marriage to confirm like three different ways on the calendar and everything else that they're going to be able to vouch that you really are still an employee and that your account should be unlocked and stuff like that. So, so that was a fun one to do. U.S. Rubber Ducky, Pack 5 product, some of you might be familiar with that. So I uh, introduced some code to their GitHub repo and got that put in a couple of years ago. It's a string delay command. So sometimes you need to be able to specify, type out a string to the device. The device is plugged in and it's back on the keyboard. It's type a string instead of keys for you. Um, so I 
that is some code to do a little test. We're going to walk around the office for people who left their terminals unlocked at their desktop, right? Keep them uh, low security. So I had to do a little like text editor fixing on it to get some of the key combinations I wanted to work. Um, but our main idea is that we walk around about the time lunch started. Oh look, someone walked over their desk and left it unlocked. We're, you know, we're going to plug this in, and then what we do is set all the monitors. Your computer has been encrypted. That was about, I had a much more worse version of this at first, and I got told by the manager, don't do that. We don't need people crying over death. And, so it says the hard disk computer has been encrypted with the military grade encryption of ROT 13 times 2 algorithm. You're hosed. Lucky for you, this is only a Rackspace authorized test. Please find below useful training material on keeping Rackspace data and computers secure. The Price would have doubled in five days, 24 hours, you know, and then the little time down timer was going, so it looks like the real deal. You know, then the button was start decryption training, then it had like bottom to test only, not real. Um, your computer was discovered on a pin unlocked, please contact us if you want assistance with this or if you need help to help us. So we had to tell like the help desk we're doing this as well in case they had any calls from people trying to figure it out or whatever. The code wasn't much, most of this code was just comments. So the WebEx is pretty easy to use for that. The results, we ran this test on two different days, at different times. We only had a prop one week of a leftover walk of a large office here in San Antonio. Probably I guess. So, so that's actually a really positive outcome. People really learned that for the second way, they walk their computer. So you sit there and walk, like, you don't have to, like, there's like a timeout and walk yourself. Lock them off and lunch. And the lock could have come on. There's actually a really positive thing about that. Do that exercise. Find out, like, oh, that's pretty cool. We got people that have learned that they lock their computers for the second one. The next one thing we get to do is capture the flag for developers. So, in front of you have kind of a developer conference for a rapid trip from San Antonio. And so, during this, we actually had a capture the flag game for them. We had about 34 players across the 11 teams that did it. There were prizes awarded for them. We gave people that were outside of the security IT area more experience with the security security space. So you have like web apps, vulnerabilities and learning, crypto, TCAP analysis, use of vulnerable web apps, things like that. The idea is to report awareness and training. The uh, particular content that I wrote for this capture the flag. Uh, was a Jumo exploit in 2015. And so I picked a remote code execution one. And the idea of the first part of the challenge is that you get an IP address and that's it. You find the services, oh, there's a web server. So you get to the root of the web server, there's nothing there, right? It's a full page. It just has this guy coming with that. So the idea of the walkthrough was that if you the source of that page, that image tag has a little hint. You can do a deep hint. And that tells us if you need to enumerate all the web server. Because just because you know, there are no links in that public page where the rest of it is at, doesn't mean somebody can just guess it, right? So we're trying to teach software developers, just because you don't think anybody knows the name of that special diagnostic page, doesn't mean you can guess it. So it's cool to find on that. So instead of that, as a default template, I had to compile a pretty old version of PHP to make it work. Um, and then just to do more enumeration, um, you can actually hit a URL of authentication for the language template file. I'll tell you what version you can on the system, and then you can export the uh, I also had a workshop. So this is a conference. I taught a two hour workshop called Raptor Hacking 101. This is a gift for people that were mostly software developers, but the most part, the primary part of it. Targeted for two beginners. Take the Poly VM, take the Minnesota Web Q VM, help them clean it up on their own laptop so they can practice later if they want. You just demonstrate enumeration techniques. You hide that web app name, you can guess and find it. Um, we have tools that you can find that to show you, hey, there's these tools you need to show you and you can test it out. And explaining how these vulnerabilities work, try to help you get an idea more of this is how hackers work and try to bring it to the software. You really think you can apply outside the back at bottom. So here under the concluding part of my presentation, technology. What are the things that help you create your walk? Feedback representation. Become a lot more popular. 
There are definitely weak parts of it. SMS back up the station. Set up a couple of minutes. Um, there are also a few that set up like this proxy site that will ask the username password and then show that safe screen that looks like it's your factual application code. Take the phone, type it in, and then that try to see the website to it. I actually have UDPs for hardware devices like this that I like a lot because these will actually do origin signing. So if you go to a website um, that's used in the tech sector, like Google, for example, if you pick up a Google EE.com trying to build you a specific device, it will sign the code to GoogleEE.com and Google.com will accept it. So this does like an origin check and that thing. Try to avoid those things if you try to try to pass that out. But it's pretty a bit costly technology. Um, I just hope the price tag comes down because it's cheap. That's my only price about that. But multi-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication can still be very helpful when it's actually used. Um, the real problem we find is that we get told all the time is just not an ease of use, a seamless experience, and so it's not really as widely deployed or popular for that reason. It's kind of frustrating, but it is starting to get somewhat easier, I hope, hopefully with some more tools, because it does help. Patching. So we talk about patching for years and years, right? If you want to building magic, management, got to get patching on every month. Why is it always so hard to do? Well, because if we patch, we're going to break something, and then it's a big house to blow that back, and all the downtime, and all that, right? And it's like, in the day of the cloud, you can have cloud servers, why don't you have your testing automation as well, right? I shouldn't even have to you know, tell you to patch. You should have already ran the latest patch last night and then the latest software build and have testing that tells me, hey, does this software work on this version of Windows 10 patches or not? And I think that's what we kind of lack a lot in the security industry is that we have the software and we've just done a lot of testing and help. Oh, yeah, we're going to do these patches. Okay, the QE team now has to take it and do a bunch of manual fix all through the web app to keep anything grow. That's just not scalable, right? And so I, one of the things we hope to see more of is that with the cloud, DevOps, security DevOps, you hear all these things, the SDLC, more automation for testing, because then that cuts down on the excuse, right? It's like, oh yeah, let's test this thing. We should be able to run it overnight and the next morning when we broke with the next latest patch or if we didn't break. Detection. Assume the bad, that bad actor's already in. You may hear this called zero trust sometimes. Assume someone's already fished. They're on a company toy laptop or whatever. They're already inside your network. You need to be able to flush them out. You want to hunt down weak areas of your network, like what I get to do in my job day to day. I go around looking for the staffing calendar. That's not crossing a credit card or anything like that, right? But it's fun to do. And it's a good way to find those weak points because just because your app doesn't have company data, no customer data, no credit card data, doesn't mean attackers are not going to use it like you would have stolen card to do a bank robbery or something like that. And so they'll try to use those systems with footholds, stay around, you want to that sort of thing. And then another hurdle for detection is log collection. If you have a fleet of employees on all their laptops, you can't pull every Windows event log from those laptops with those simple stem to view them all just because you need terabytes, petabytes of disk space. You've got to give them all a cost and the access to location. So how do you manage that? That's been a big challenge for many companies that I've worked at. Um, is how do we get these logs? Agents become more helpful with that because they can parse for relevant events on the device and then Step them to you in an abbreviated form to try to help because you can't copy so much data and now it's kind of help distribute it. And then user awareness. You know, it's a constant reoccurring need. New employees come, new techniques come out, you have to create developers over again. How do you do that in a good way that fosters communication with the security team? You know, we'd like to do the phishing one for up the phishing exercise and show the people we got. But then people start thinking, oh no, it's email, you know, the security going to catch me again when they got me. So, is that necessarily the attitude that you want people to have if they're afraid of security catching them? Got you again? Or do you want them to feel more like human this, right? And that's really the balance that we try to strive to find and continue to do with our system owners. It's really awesome when a system owner comes to us and says, Hey, I heard about this vulnerability and I'm wondering if you're vulnerable and you're interacting with me. Like, you came to us and asked us that, so I'm going to kind of tell you to patch it. That's pretty awesome, right? And we'll even go over and say, Hey, here's some technical code of how to do it and reproduce it over on production page. And running a VM on your machine or something like that, right? And that's pretty cool because they get to do some of the technical geeky stuff they like to do. Cause they like either whether they're Linux admins, software devs, or stuff like that. They like to learn new things, get to play new tools, and stuff like that. And we get to foster that kind of communication and innovation. And the last 
about different water quality and whether the company's handling that or not and different aspects of that. It's a bit of a cultural shift, right? Because especially depending on your management, the way your company functions, you're going to call it even more you can't let those out. We're not going to put those on the public internet, right? So that just makes you a practice and after us. So you can show them that the company is out of the situation and the different aspects of that, the legal aspects and all those pieces. But we find that the more we can be transparent about our security issues with our groups and our fellow employees, the more it helps build build trust and helps add more to that communication because they don't feel like they're just being left out in the dark so that they have to fix these things. They understand a little bit more about what the impact, ultimately what is the real business of the If I fix these things, this is the support. And that was the conclusion of my presentation. Were there any questions? Did you have about a minute? So the question is about our process and procedures and how we capture the testing results of that and how we do our lessons learned to distribute that. So a big part of that is um, as security groups, when we talk to the different functional units, you know, we'll have weekly meetings to discuss different things that have come up, different exploits and whatnot. As well as when we do an exercise, we actually write up a full report about that. And that's given to the management, all the different management groups, change levels, to go through the review as well. Thank you all very much.